Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Welcome to this week's special Erasing History Left Wing Lunacy. We're going to talk to a Yale Law School professor about George Washington, why we should not be tearing down statues to the father of our country. I'm going to talk to Larry Elder about his new documentary, Uncle Tom, uh, who, by the way, in the book, Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom's the hero of the book. Right? In a sane world, it would be an incredible compliment to be called an Uncle Tom. Uh, we're also going to talk to a young conservative who is fighting to protect these statues and keep them up as local officials either do nothing or vote to remove the statues themselves. So that's what we have uh, for you in, in just a little bit here. But two quick questions, or two quick stories before we uh, get started with the show. So last week I read Booker T. Washington's biography, Up From Slavery. Uh, he was a slave. Uh, Emancipation Proclamation came when he was nine years old. It reads like a Klan manual. It's unbelievable. Today, by today's standards, this guy would be considered a white supremacist Klan member. Certainly an Uncle Tom, no doubt about it. It's about hard work, and but more importantly, it's about forgiveness and, and not being bitter. A former slave. Let me show you this story. It talks about a man in Ohio, a former slave. He made a deal with his master that he, and his master was from Virginia, that he could go to Ohio and send money back to buy his freedom over a certain number of years. This was three years prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. So when the Emancipation Proclamation came out, he was, he was freed, right? Slavery ended. But he still owes some money. Right? He still had, he was still, he didn't fulfill his end of the deal yet, even though the Emancipation Proclamation came. He was still in debt, $300. Here's Booker T. Washington. Notwithstanding that the Emancipation Proclamation freed him from any obligation to his master, this black man walked the greater portion of the distance back to where his old master lived in Virginia and placed the last dollar with interest in his hands. In talking to me about this, the man told me that he knew he did not have to pay the debt, but that he had given his word to the master, and his word he had never broken. He felt that he could not enjoy his freedom till he had fulfilled his promise. What? <laughs> that, I mean, that's the, that's the parable of the, the workers in the vineyard in the Bible. This man and his former master agreed to terms. End of story. He was going to fulfill them. He was going to keep his word. Nothing else could change that fact. That's an amazing story. That, so that's that man. Meanwhile, today, Pharrell wants reparations. But just really sit on this for a minute. This former slave still had the integrity and the honor to be a man of his word. He could, he could have not paid his former master the money they agreed upon and every single person would have found that to be entirely acceptable. I mean, it was an evil thing that he was even, right, he was buying his freedom from another man. But it not, didn't matter. His word he had never broken, and he could not enjoy his freedom until he fulfilled his promise. That's unbelievable. So many people have freedom today and don't have an ounce of the integrity that that former slave had. So Booker T. Washington's book, it's all about forgiveness, not feeling bitter towards even his slave owners. Booker T. Washington rejected the idea that there's a legacy of slavery that could keep him down. Yet we're supposed to believe that a black student at an Ivy League university today is oppressed because of the legacy of slavery. Give me a break. A former slave can forgive his slave master. And we're tearing down statues of George Washington. We're going to blow up Mount Rushmore because they had slaves. Slavery couldn't keep black people from wanting to learn and uh, to read, and it couldn't keep families apart. But today, we're supposed to believe that the legacy of slavery keeps kids in Baltimore from knowing how to read, and today, the legacy of slavery is breaking up families. Total nonsense. But if we erase our history, we won't be able to learn from these great men who did not whine and did not complain, but overcame. Second story real quick from uh, the biography of Josiah Henson. It's called uh, Road to Dawn. It's a fantastic book. Josiah Henson was the inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is said to have sparked the Civil War. 
So Josiah is a, an older man, uh, and there's so many stories to share here, but I want to get to our guest here. We'll share it more on my regular show. Uh, but he went to his first, first church service uh, as, a, as a man. Uh, here's what it says. This is from the author, uh, who's an amazing guy as well. Uh, one thing Josiah's faith had given him was the ability to forgive. We talk a lot about how this woke religion uh, has everything religion has uh, except for redemption and forgiveness. So Josiah had his faith gave him the ability to forgive. He forgave his master for the beatings he inflicted on him as a child. and He lived a horrible slave existence. In that moment, a transformation occurred in Josiah's heart. He became painfully aware not only of the spiritual dimension of the great sin of slavery, but also of the subtler faults in his own life. He perceived the shadowy darkness of his pride and ego, his arrogance and selfishness. This was his spiritual awakening. Josiah Henson, a slave who was beat mercilessly countless times, he had personal reflection of his own sins and failings. We have rioters and protesters today who don't have any personal reflection of themselves in the midst of all this. They're just tearing down statues because of other people's sins. But you're perfect. You're wonderful. You've never sinned. No need to reflect on you at all. No one would ever tear down a statue of you in a hundred years because you're so perfect and righteous in every way, they think. I think we could all use a bit more internal reflection like Josiah and also some more reflection on our history. And the more we do that, I think we realize how strong these great men were and how weak we've become. We're going to talk about George Washington next. Erasing history. Left-wing lunacy. Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special Erasing History, left-wing lunacy. Uh, we're seeing statues being torn down, and we've shared stories of statues being torn down because they're white men, and they turn out to be amazing abolitionists who, who fought to, to end slavery, and even, uh, talk about ignorance, uh, you know, uh, vandalizing the statue of the 54th Regiment during the Civil War, which was an all-black regiment which fought to end slavery. It's like, what are, what's going on here? But then you see statues being torn out of George Washington. Remember Trump back in 2017 about the Robert E. Lee statue said, what are you going to do next? Tear down George Washington, Thomas Jefferson? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, first person I thought of was Logan Byrne. He's a um, lecturer in law at the Yale Law School. He wrote a book a couple years ago, Blood of Tyrants, George Washington and the Forging of the Presidency. Logan, how are you, brother? Very good. How are you? Good to talk to you. So when you see a statue of, of anyone but George Washington come down as a historian, his biographer, uh, what do you think of that? How do you, first of all, how do you feel? And then what do you think? I, I feel pained. I think that his history and what that statue represents is, is our country and our ideals. So when you put a statue of something somewhere, you are showcasing sort of the virtues of that person. You're, and in the case of George Washington, he was, he was the father of our country. This is not sort of a, a name we gave him after his life. It's something they gave him during his life. Um, and they refer to him as the indispensable man. So when you talk about the ideals of America, the pursuit of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, um, equality for all, all of these ideals, which we don't definitely don't always live up to, um, but what is up there and we're striving towards, it's thanks in largest part to him. He is the one person um, of them all, bar none, bar, you know, bar mm -hmm. Jefferson, Franklin, uh, Adams, you name it, Washington was the most important man in establishing our country. And, and the, the, the sort of the irony of it all is that we have the freedom to protest Washington, to to be having these conversations, to be criticizing Washington. And, and again, don't get me wrong, I want to gloss over the fact that Washington owned 123 people. Awful, incredibly horrible, full stop. Um, what I want to talk, what I want to say is that as you know, a deeply flawed human being, um, when we put a statue of up there, we are promoting the good. And we are trying to, unif that's a unifying force in our country that has as always been. Um, 
and to tear it down is, um, it, 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 I think it has a counterproductive effect on our strive towards those ideals. Mm. Mm, very good. Okay, all right, I got a ton of questions. Let's start at the top. Give us, uh, share like a story or two that you think best exemplifies maybe one of the one of the great virtues of the man, George Washington. There are so many. So Washington, he uh, fought valiantly during the Revolutionary War for the rights of Americans to vote on their leaders. He established civilian control over the military. He risked his life to protect citizens from oppression. Uh, he removed, uh, he refused the opportunity to become king. People wanted him to become king, but he went back to his farm instead so that others could have liberty. Uh, he returned from retirement even after that to save the country from anarchy when we were falling apart. Um, he pioneered our system of checks and balances. Uh, so this was a man of action. This was a man of principle. He, um, during the Revolutionary War, uh, he gave up his, you know, he risked his life and his fortune so that he could fight for the cause and, um, and free us of the oppression of the king. And this is, he's not the type of general of the era where they'd be watching from afar and, and sort of calculating and mapping. Um, that, that's how most generals did it. Washington would literally be in the front lines in the Battle of uh, Trenton. He was caught um, between two lines of fire because he was, he was the guy on the horse in the front, literally. And he was caught between the lines of fire. And one of the soldiers on the American side wrote in his journal, I covered my eyes with my hat because surely the general had to have been hit in the crossfire. But then from the smoke, a booming voice said, the fine fox chase boys, charge. Washington was that man who would have horses shot out from underneath him and say, get me a new horse. Um, he, he was a mythical figure even in his own time. Mm. What is one, I love all those answers. What's one virtue that you want your kids to have? and you can point to it and you can be like, oh, that's just like George Washington. You are X, or what you did is X, just like George Washington was. He was principled and he never gave up. He never gave up those principles. Um, so I, you know, I think when we look to, to statues of him, we were looking to, again, those virtues. So establishing life, the, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, that, those were his principles and he would do anything to get them. And I think that's a really appropriate question for this time because I see a lot of, um, analogies between what's happening with the statues and sort of um, any kind of figures and, and, and our parents. So Washington being the father of our country is sort of our national parent. And when you, when, as you grow up, you start seeing your, your parents as sort of as partially flawed people, which again, Washington absolutely was. Um, and then sort of, where do you go with that? Do you decide that your parents are completely awful, take all the pictures off the wall? And, and sometimes that's, that's right. Um, in the case of Washington, I, I personally don't think it is because I think there's a lot of good to be celebrated there. Uh, and at the same time, I don't want to gloss over the fact that he owns human beings, completely awful. I think that is an important conversation for, for humanity. Throughout the, all of history, there have been slaves. People have been uh, thrown into bondage. And Washington fought against that for white people his main sin was that he didn't go far enough and, and seeing that he should be expanding that to the, the Africans um, that were here as well. And I think that is an important conversation to be had. And every historian, every book I've read on Washington has it. So I don't think it's something that's necessarily whitewashed. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's, you know, uh, correct to, to be pulling down his statues. Um, I, think it's, I think that's counterproductive. I have no problem when my kids are a little older, they're three and under, but looking at a statue of George Washington, hopefully I could be as articulate as you just were about all his virtues and the wonderful things he did. And then also, I think it's super important to talk about the reasons why he wasn't actually a god. Uh, and that's, I don't, I don't know why anyone would not want to also include those things in the story. I think that's super important. First of all, why is that important? And then maybe if I can ask you another failing of his or another, another aspect of his personality or whatever that, that wasn't perfect uh, because he was human. What's something else you could point to? Well, he was, he was far from perfect. And I think it makes him so much more interesting. I think when you see him yeah. as some sort of any God who divined all these answers, uh, okay, yawn. I mean, that's, that's the story. <laughs> um, he wasn't, he, he was, all the founding fathers and that's the, that's the point. Every single person throughout history 
was a human being with deep flaws. Let's explore those flaws and see how we can get, make sure we don't go back to them. Um, but at the same time, to tear down all the virtues, I think it's sort of we need to be, and I think people definitely are smart enough to be able to hold a couple ideas in their head at the same time. That is, flawed mm -hmm. individual, um, and as, but also a lot of virtues we do want to celebrate and symbolize as a uniting force in our country. Um, so for, for Washington's example, he was, um, he, he, was, he had a chip on his shoulder about his education. So I think last time I was speaking with you, we were talking about how his when his father died, he sort of lost that sort of upper crust education going to Europe. And instead, he was um, schooled at home in, in America, which was sort of looked down upon by the, the gentry of the time. And he had a chip on his shoulder about that. And so he, the way he reacted to that sort of um, insecurity about his own education uh, was he surrounded himself with really smart people like Hamilton and he relied on them and, and worked with them. So he's an intelligent guy lacking in formal education that Jefferson would have. Um, but he made up for that with his greatest virtue, which I think is, which is perseverance. Love that. Um, this is mind reading, not fair to do, but if I had to ask anyone, I'd ask one of his historians, uh, if you were around today and there was a crowd tearing down his statue, what do you think he would do or say about that? So he, you know, it's interesting because he saw um, the, the impulse for uh, activism and protest as an important right. And so he would defend that to his death. I think where he would draw the line would be sort of the violence. So people talking about taking down a statue, having conversation, bringing it to their, their local um, aldermen, bringing it to their, their state capitals, or having the conversation, he would die to defend that right. Um, when you cross the line for Washington is when you resort to violence. So this is the difference between fighting against the British versus after the war is won, where you have the right to vote, you have the right to effectuate change, and then you get into something like Shays' Rebellion, where you're taking up arms against the Massachusetts legislature. Um, that was an important dividing line for Washington. Once you have the right to vote, and you have the right to, part to participate in your in your government, to run to uh, for public service, um, to advocate for your cause um, via the media. Um, all of these things that he would die for to to defend your right to do that. But then when you start getting violent and just violently pulling down statues, when you start getting in fist fights in the streets um, over these statues, that would be the line for him. Blood of Tyrants, George Washington and the Forging of the Presidency. Um, I, th I want to encourage all of our audience to uh, just, just be immersed and really know George Washington deeply and profoundly. I, they can tear down statues, but it doesn't mean they can tear, you know, tear his memory down um, if it's up to us. Logan, what's another book you recommend of George Washington's on top of yours uh, for someone to get a full flavor of the man? George, uh, Ron Chernow's George Washington of Life. I mean, it's it, okay. it's it's incredible. It's you know it's it's, it's lengthy. It has such great pithy detail. Um, I, I love it. I you know I, I spoke with him a bit when I was writing my book, and he was incredibly encouraging and um, a really mm -hmm. an excellent, smart man. That I highly encourage you to read that book as okay. well. So that's the one. So that's the one. Uh, which one first? Blood of Tyrants or Chernow's? <laughs> Chernow, if you want sort of a, a very in-depth uh, biography in all facets of George Washington's life, I highly recommend it. Uh, Blood of Tyrants is a little different. I, I wrote it. I wanted to read like a novel, but be completely factual. Um, I, there are 1,400 footnotes in the book for those who really wanted to dig into the weeds. Wow. But I didn't want people, I want people to read it and sort of have a page turn like a novel. Where, where, what does it feel like to be in these battles? What, is, what are people eating? What are they drinking? Um, and I wanted to show uh, show it in that form and also make it very applicable to today. So in Blood of Tyrants, I'm looking at it through the, the lens of the Constitution. So we're looking at the, the rights of citizens during wartime. We're looking at um, dealing with enemy combatants. Um, all of the sorts of uh, issues we still debate today, I want to look at how Washington approached and triumphed over them. So that it was a it was a uh, you know, a page turner. I hoped that would also be very applicable to today's conversation. Okay, so we can either read this book and know more about Washington, or we can tear a statue down. Pick a side: Blood of Tyrants, George Washington, and the Forging of the Presidency. Logan Byrne. Logan, awesome to talk to you, man. Let's do it again. Good to see you. I look forward to it, brother. Appreciate you. you, Mike Slater. Spread the word.
Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special Erasing History, left-wing lunacy. Here is your antidote to this lunacy, this new documentary that just came out called Uncle Tom. Here's a little trailer. Most people are completely oblivious to the history of the Democratic Party. The party of slavery. The history of the Democratic Party. Jim Crow laws. They're erasing all of the history of this country. They want to cover up history. The real history, not the revisionist history. If you are educated... Black people have been taught a narrative that has been created. You're actually miseducated. And that's when I realized I've been lied to. I had been misled. It unraveled everything that I knew to be true. Uh, this is so good. You can download it, you can watch it now. UncleTom.com, and it's from the great Larry Elder. Mr. Elder, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Man, I'm grateful you're here and grateful for this documentary. Have you ever seen anything like this, Larry, in your life? Uh, you mean anything like what's going on right now in the streets? Yeah, yeah, what, what the heck's it, happening, just in our it, culture in general? Well, well, it's insane, and it's all driven by emotion because the argument is that the police are going out and, and mowing down black people. The data show the opposite. If anything, the police are more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black person than on a white person or even Hispanic person. Uh, and according to the CDC in the last 50, 60 years, Mike, uh, the percentage at which blacks have been killed by the police has declined 75 uh, percent. The number one problem facing black America is not racist cops. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately the minority of young black kid that is terrorizing the neighborhoods. Of, of all the homicides in this country, almost half of them are, are black victims, and virtually none of them is killed by a white nationalist or a Confederate general. The whole thing is absolutely insane. What it's doing is getting people killed and getting people hurt because the police pull back, the bad guys know it, uh, and also you're causing young black men to be unduly confrontational with cops. If they believe the cops are going to harass them or hurt them, why not be confrontational? So you're making uh, things worse and you're hurting the very same people that the Black Lives Matter people claim that they care about. What, why do people not listen to the data? You're the king of data. <laughs> why, do, why are people so, they, they're so driven by the emotion part of it? How do we get people to see the data and then be driven by that instead? That's so difficult. Because a lot of people falsely believe that virtually every problem can be connected to slavery and Jim Crow. The number one problem facing black America is a large number of kids raised without fathers. About 70% of black kids today are raised without fathers. That number was 25% in 1965. Are you telling me that between 1965 and right now, the country has gotten more racist? If that can't be the answer. The answer is government policy that has incentivized women to marry the government and allowed men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. And forget about elder. Obama once said, a kid raised by the father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Now, the question is, why have we had this proliferation of, uh, of black kids being born outside of wedlock? And the answer is the welfare state. And the left can't have that discussion because they caused it. Amazing. If you could get a black kid to understand one thing about either this country or his opportunity in this country, what would you want him to understand? Pick up your cards and play them to the best of your ability. This is the greatest country uh, in, in, in history in terms of being able to live out your potential. And you can't make it in America, you can't make it anywhere. And not to appreciate that is to really spit on the legacy of people like MLK and like my own father, who was thrown out of the house when he was 13 years old, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South at the beginning of the Great Depression. My dad went down the road, did whatever he could. Ultimately, he became a Marine, uh, got out of the Marine, couldn't get a job as a cook because of racism. Uh, he ended up becoming a janitor, worked two full time job at the janitor, saved his nickels and dimes, started a little cafe, and ran that until his 80s, and my dad ended up being a property owner. This is what happens in America. And clearly things are a lot better than they were when my dad grew up. And, and remember, this is a country that elected a, a black guy with a funny last name and a middle name, uh, Hussein, and he talked, knocked off Hillary, <laughs> got, got reelected with a tepid uh, recovery, and we're still talking about racism in America? It, it's asinine. And all you're doing is telling people not to, not to work hard, not to press forward, which is what most black people have done in this country. Most black people are not poor. Mm. Most black people are middle class or better. And they did so by picking up their cards uh, and playing them to the best of their ability. And that's what I urge everybody and anybody to do, no matter what your race, no matter your gender. I, I, I keep hearing these stories uh, from black people. And I want to ask you if you have a story of, of racism in your life and how you interpreted that slash overcame it. 
You know, my people ask me that a lot because of my positive attitude. Have you ever been called the N-word and that sort of thing? No one ever asked me, have you ever been called an Uncle Tom or a bootlicker or a Sambo? Uh, that's happened so many times, I can't even keep track of that. But wow. um, no, I've never had anything that, that, that convinced me that I couldn't become what I wanted to be. My parents always told me nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. And that's why I did this movie, Uncle Tom. The conservatives in this movie are simply telling black people, maybe just maybe we ought not be pulling that lever 95% for the party that supports Roe v. Wade when 25% of abortions are performed on black women. Maybe just maybe we ought not be in the party of open borders when studies show that unskilled illegal aliens threaten jobs that would otherwise be held by unskilled Americans and puts downward pressure on their wages. Maybe just maybe we ought not be in the po in a party that opposes school choice. Most inner city parents recognize that their local government school is an underperforming school. They would like an option out. The Democrats say, hell no, you're going to that school anyway. Republicans want to give you an option. And the Democrats are still getting 95% of the black vote. What's up with that? Yeah, we, we did a segment the other day where we said, if, if my intent was to hurt a race or a group of people, we would, you would do all the things you talked about right now. You would segregate schools. You would murder black babies. That, uh, for start, you'd mar I love you. The marry the government is a good example. You financially, incentive. you would do all the things that the Democrats have done systematically over the last few decades. If your goal was to hurt a particular race, so I love this line you had before. You said ninety five percent, or ninety five percent of people won't vote as a block unless they're being lied to. Right. Do, do you know of any other prior, any other precedent of 95% of an ethnic group voting one particular way? That's wild. I, I really don't know. And the reason is because black people have been taught by Hollywood, by media, by academia, and of course by the Democrats, uh, that the Republican Party is racist. And by the way, we're the good guys. And they completely obscured their history. One of the things we do in Uncle Tom is go over the history of the respective parties. And the Democratic nice. Party was a party of slavery. It was founded... Uh, one of their founding principles was to preserve slavery, while the Re Republican Party, one of their founding principles was to stop the spread of it, eventually to eliminate it. And the Democrats opposed the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment uh, unanimously. Uh, Democrats founded the KKK, uh, and as a percentage of the party, more Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act of 64 than did Democrats. But that history has been completely obscured. I didn't learn that until I got into college. Well, I wanted to ask you what your conservative awakening was in your life personally. Well, I never had one. People ask me that a lot, and it, it's, it's attitudinal. See, my father was a lifelong Republican. My father always believed Democrats uh, want to give you something for nothing, and when you try and get something for nothing, you almost always end up getting nothing for something. So my dad was always very skeptical about government intervention, about high taxes, and about high regulations. And because of that, I just instinctively did not, never felt myself as a victim. And I think a lot of uh, black people are in the Democratic Party because they, they feel aggrieved. They feel that the, the, the criminal justice system is racist when it is not. They feel academia is racist when it is not. And so uh, I never had that kind of woe is me, I feel oppressed attitude. And for that reason, I was far more receptive to hearing the other side. And the older I got when I studied economics, when I studied history, I began realizing that limited government uh, is better to maximize people's potential and that many of the things that the left has done has made things worse. So I just, uh, I'm rereading currently the biography of Josiah Henson, who was the inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin, which obviously right. your movie's Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com, everyone's got to download it, watch it right now. Uh, so I just read, I'm rereading that, and I just read um, Booker T. Washington's autobiography on slavery. Up neither of these guys, through, up from slavery, thank you, neither of these guys, they, they explicitly said, I am, I, I am not bitter towards my slave owners who beat me mercilessly. Yet today, we have people who are bitter over, like, like, like if, if Booker T. Washington or Josiah Henson <laughs> looked at the, the oppression that someone in an Ivy League university is facing today, like, I don't even know what their reaction would be. Why today is there so much bitterness when even the slaves didn't have that much bitterness? It's, it's all about revenge. It's all about revenge. And, and the whole thing about reparations, that's an extraction of money from people who were never slave owners to be given to people who were never slaves. The whole thing is insane. And you're quite right about Josiah Henson. He was the inspiration for Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel. And when people say Uncle Tom, it really means that they haven't read the novel because they would realize yeah. if they had that he was, in fact, the hero. But it sort of doesn't matter because the term is now morphed into you're a sellout, you're an Uncle Tom, you're out to get your own people. Why, so why do you think the grievancing, the grievous industry, the industrial grievance complex is so appealing to a person? 
Well, if you feel that you haven't gotten what you want, uh, you haven't gotten to the station in life what you want, uh, and you can blame somebody else, it makes it very comfortable. And that's why I think there's so much venom against people like myself, Candace Owens, uh, Walter Williams, Thomas Sowell, Herman Cain, and others who are featured in this film. If you tell people that, well, if you're not happy, if you feel that you are in some sort of plight, the answer is look in the mirror and figure out what to do about it because you put yourself there through uh, decisions that you made or decisions that, decisions that you didn't make. And nobody wants to hear that. Once you're a victim and you can blame somebody else, at least you can blame somebody else for why you're not happy. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I, I hate to you know throw this on you to like solve the problem right now, <laughs> but what's the, <laughs> solve the problem, right? Like I remember Rush Limbaugh a while back said it's really hard to beat Santa Claus in an election, right? The Democrats are giving stuff sure. away. How do you beat Santa Claus? This is a similar thing here, right? Like how do you come to that person and say, work hard? Like that's way harder than be aggrieved and complain. So what do you suggest? You know, after, uh, after Dylan Roof shot up all those church goers, uh, the next day on Morning Joe, one of the Democratic candidates, Martin O'Malley, was there. And he was talking about America's institutional racism and how this is a reflection of that. And one of the co-panelists turned to him and said, well, uh, Martin, what do, we, what do we do about this? And Martin went, um, well, uh, we, uh, we, we, do it by, we, um, we do it by acknowledging, uh, 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 well, I, I really don't know what you do about this. Now, this is a man who was mayor of Baltimore, governor of Maryland. You never thought about what to do about the institutional racism that you whine about all the time. Maybe just maybe it's because it doesn't exist. Maybe just maybe we're not having institutional racism. It's actually easier for a black kid with a given SAT score and a given set of grades compared to a white kid with the same SAT scores and grades. The black kid will have an easier time getting in than the white kid. Now, if education is the route to the middle class, who has an easier route? It is a lie that black people are being burdened because of racism uh, and because of, of Jim Crow. The, the, the real problem, as I said over and over again, is the lack a father in the home. Look at the number of hours that are spent in studying uh, in an Asian home, white home, Hispanic home versus black home, and black kids are studying less than anybody else. Surprise, surprise, their grades are not as good as anybody else. The reason for this is because there's nobody in the house to tell them when to go to bed and tell them make sure that they, they've done your homework. If you don't have that, you are toast in our society. Mm. Uh, was there anything that you found surprising or anything you learned from the uh, wonderful people you talked to in your documentary? Pretty much, uh, we all had uh, similar stories. Uh, all of us uh, uh, overcame. All of us felt that uh, we had uh, ample opportunities in the country. All of us are getting pushed back for simply saying that uh, uh, to the general public. So I didn't really learn a whole lot. What I did, however, learn uh, is the reaction from liberals who've seen this, which has been fascinating, because I really mm -hmm. want liberals to see it. Mike, you're not gonna feel any differently when you see the film. I want left-wing people to, to see the film and have them come out differently. And one of my left-wing friends saw it and he said two things. First of all, he said, I thought it was going to be about you. And I said, that would have been boring. The second thing <laughs> is, I thought it was going to be an hour and a half of people pontificating, telling people what to think. And you guys don't do that. You're telling people they are free to think, which is exactly uh, yeah, yeah. the reaction I hoped I was going to get. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's a totally, that's good. That's a great nuance. I love mm -hmm. that. Okay, so, so you, you suggest we not only watch it like bring a friend, bring a liberal friend, bring someone on the fence, bring, uh, invite someone over who's maybe brainwashed by this whole Black Lives Matter thing. What do you think the worst thing is about the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, it's built upon a lie. It's built upon a lie that the police are out to get people. Uh, and also think about it. The, you hear the left often talk about they want a diversified police department that looks like the community that they police. Well, if you're out there calling the police Nazis uh, and fascists and racists, that's not exactly the kind of recruiting tool that you're gonna to use to get good people to become police officers. So all you're doing, again, is getting people killed. You're calling, causing the cops to pull back. Bad guys know that. They're gonna become more brazen and you're gonna deter good people from joining the police department. Well done. And look at 2015 yeah. in Baltimore where Freddie Gray died. You're talking about a city where the mayor is black. The number one and number two guys running the police department were black. All of city council is Democrat, majority black. The state attorney who brought charges against six officers was black. Three of the six officers black. The uh, judge before whom two of the cases were tried black. The U.S. Attorney General at the time, Loretta Lynch, black. Oh, and by the way, the President of the United States at the time, Barack Obama, was black. And we're talking about <laughs> institutional racism. I mean, as Wanda Sykes, the comedian, said after Obama got elected, how are you going to complain about the man when you are the man? So knock it off. <laughs> what do you think about the statues being torn down, Larry? 
I asked my mom and my dad what they thought about that. My mom uh, is from Huntsville, Alabama. My dad, as I mentioned, from Athens, Georgia. And they both said, out of all the things there are to worry about in America, bad schools, crime, uh, the, the economic uh, problems we're having in the inner city, and we're talking about removing Confederate statues, my dad said, let's say you remove every single one of them. Will the problems that, that are facing this country mm -hmm. and the black community in particular still remain? And the answer is yes. So Larry Elder is indifferent. I understand the anger. I get all of that. What I would prefer is to have another, maybe another monument explaining why it is that these people are flawed, and maybe some more monuments of other people that you think are worthy to be uh, to be worshipped. But I wouldn't go yeah. around tearing down the statues and moving them just because uh, all of a sudden, through the prism of our perspective in 2020, we now deem these people to be uh, to be evil. I don't think that's fair. Great point. I haven't heard any suggestion. Go ahead. I was going to say, how far are you going to go with this? On Obama's side, on his mom's side, there were slave owners. Uh, should we take down everything having to do with Barack Obama? What about Harry Truman? Harry Truman, in a letter once, referred to uh, Jews with the K word and referred to New York as K Town. Now, uh, if you want to take the worst thing anybody's ever said or done and, uh, and obliterate everything they've ever done on the positive side, go ahead. Uh, that's going to be a very, very long and challenging thing for a lot of people to do. And a lot of heroes that you like are going to be hurt too. Yeah. I haven't heard any suggestion from Black Lives Matter on who they want to build statues to. Uh, interestingly enough. Okay, last question for you, Larry. You've been super generous with your time. Everyone go watch the movie, UncleTom.com. Uh, if you are in, uh, name a city that's on fire right now, and you go to a riot, it's the middle of the night, Larry Elder goes on the street in the middle of the night, and you have rioters breaking down, w busting windows, about to light a Wendy's on fire, let's say, and Larry Elder gets in the front of the crowd, in between the building and the crowd, what do you tell this black boy, black man, who's about to do something destructive? What do you say to him? Go home, do your homework. That's what I would tell them to do. <laughs> Go home, do your homework. And do two good hard hours of homework every single night. Graduate with a, with a degree that means you can read, write, and compute at grade level, and then go on. Uh, don't have a kid until you're 20 years old. Don't have a kid before you get married, and you will be just fine. And put down the gasoline and go back home. That's what I would tell them. <laughs> UncleTom.com. Watch the movie right now. Larry, grateful for you, sir. Keep up the great work. You got it, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Erasing history, left-wing lunacy, one way to uh, combat it. UncleTom.com. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders. Welcome back to our special Erasing History, Left-Wing Lunacy. So... You know, listen to Jesse and Buck a lot talk about wartime conservatism and what that looks like. And I've been thinking about what my role is in that because everyone has a different role to play. And I don't know yet, quite frankly. Uh, but I'm becoming an old man, <laughs> 35. Back hurts, I'm tired. <laughs> so I'm looking at these statues being torn down and I'm like, someone's got to stop that. Not me. I got, I'm <laughs> old. There's got to be some young whippersnapper out there. And then, sure enough, here is Gavin Wax. He's the president of the New York Young Republican Club, and he was out there defending a Teddy Roosevelt statue, among others, the other day. And I said, yes, we need more of him. Gavin, how are you, brother? I'm great, Mike. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Tell me about, uh, let's specifically start with the Teddy Roosevelt statue. Uh, what happened? Well, absolutely. Uh, this uh, board of directors, uh, this woke board of directors of the Museum of Natural History decided uh, it was in the best interests of themselves uh, to prove their wokeness and virtue signal to the world by removing the equestrian statue of Teddy Roosevelt, which greets millions as they enter into the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, our 26th president was the reason that uh, institution is there today. Uh, he was a great man. He founded uh, a lot of political movements. He was ahead of his time, uh, and he deserves a lot better than to have his uh, the, the statue commemorating him be torn down uh, in this frenzy to destroy our past that we see uh, going on across our country. It's pretty wild. There's uh, two groups of people tearing down statues. You have people in the middle of the night wearing masks, and then you have the board of the museum and the New York City Council taking down statues of Teddy Roosevelt, right? So there's two different right. groups doing it. What, what's the problem with Teddy Roosevelt? Do you know what their argument is? 
Well, first they tried to claim it was the hierarchical composition, which uh, is just basically a fancy way for saying that he is the prominent figure in his own statue, that he is the focal point of a statue commemorating him. But now they're basically attacking him for who he was as an individual. I mean, now he's an imperialist, he's a colonialist, he's this, he's that. So okay. the, the problem here is they always move the goalpost, they'll always uh, eat their own, they'll attack him. He was a progressive at the end of the day. I'm a conservative, I'm defending him. Uh, and this is about much more than ideology. It's about you know preserving our history. So. Uh, uh, we can't remove him. We can't destroy the past. We need to learn from the past to build a better future. Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt is one of the most impressive human beings, certainly in American history, like beyond measure. Uh, what was the first thing you said? <laughs> why why they want to get rid of it? It's something composition? What's that term? Uh, yeah, it's this really uh, academic uh, way of saying yeah. they just don't like him. Hierarchical composition. Okay, what, 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 I don't even, like, how can that, what does that mean? Like, every statue is of a, a person. <laughs> well, Precisely. They were hoping no one would actually dig into this. It was one of their vapid statements <laughs> about the press, and no one would press them on it. And they're thinking, oh, these dumb conservatives, they probably don't know what this means. I mean, it's all hoity-toity yeah. nonsense. Uh, of course, it's a hierarchical statue. He's on a horse. I mean, if you're on a horse, it's going to be hierarchical. <laughs> you don't love horse. What? So, I mean. <laughs> what um, so what was the end result uh, so far of, of what y'all did, and uh, where's the statue now? Look, we're under no illusion. We know we're up against the institutions here in New York. It's an uphill battle, but they were trying to do this in the dead of night. They wanted no transparency. They wanted just to remove it without any backlash, without anyone knowing. So our rally, which brought over 200 patriots out in the scorching heat uh, to the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which you know is a very big conservative hotbed, uh, they came out there, <laughs> uh, they let their voices be heard. Uh, now it's got an international press. It's got tons of press. We have a video online with 2 million views. Uh, so we, we put some heat cool. on this board of directors. And uh, now yeah. there's a bill actually in the city council uh, from a uh, Republican council member, uh, Joe Borelli, who's uh, trying to push uh, legislation that says that any type of removal of a public statue or monument requires a public referenda. There needs to be some transparency. There mm. needs to be public input into what happens. And I'm not saying we'll win the vote, but at least do it uh, through a proper process, not just you know unilaterally. Yeah, it was Jesse Kelly who said uh, these companies and board of directors or whatever, they're not going to stop caving and doing all these things until they're scared of conservatives. Uh, exactly. Right, and until you and people like you push back, and and I'm I'm so grateful you're doing that. Why do you care, Gavin? What's it What's it to you? I think our country's at an inflection point, and you know we all saw the, the this, our cities burning, the mobs outside the White House. I mean, we're really entering into a our dark period of our history, and I think people need to make a decision if they want to stand up for this country and everything it stands for, or they just want to let it uh, just continue to decay and continue on this path that it's heading. Uh, and you know, I think there is a massive silent majority out there that want to see this kind of fight. And uh, due to the outpour that we've received, my club, me as an individual, uh, I think people are, are are finally sick and tired of our weak leadership and they're looking uh, for people to lead a fight back. So I, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, What's um, what was your pivot point of being a conservative? Why, like wh where, well, where'd you, where did you personally start going down this road? I mean, look, I've, I've I, in high school, I think I would probably describe myself as a Democrat and a socialist. I mean, I've definitely changed my views over the years. I mean, I read a ton. Uh, I kept my my mind open. I wasn't just, you know, sitting, you know, in my own little eco chamber. I think I was lucky that I sort of missed uh, this massive kind of indoctrination period uh, that sort of hit the college campuses probably under the last few years of Obama and right into the beginning of Trump. Uh, that's when things, I think, got really bad. So I was still able to, you know, kind of avoid the politicization of our education system. Uh, but I think millions of Americans, uh, you know, they go into these millions of young Americans, uh, they go into these uh, education systems, they come out uh, de-educated, they come out uh, not even knowing uh, who these statues uh, represent, uh, who, who they're about. I mean, that's why you see people knocking down abolitionist statues. That's why you see people knocking yeah. down or trying to knock down Abraham Lincoln statues. It's it's a mass, uh, you know, uh, misinformation campaign that's going on, and we need to fight back against it. I think you're right. You may be the so I'm 35, and I so I graduated college in 2007, and and I felt the same way. And you may be the youngest person to have just missed like total yeah. crazy town indoctrination yeah. in universities. Right, you're like yep. the last man out before, <laughs> before things totally jump sharp. Um, what are you hearing exactly. from uh, other young people? Not young, crazy activists, right? But um, yep. just like normal 25 year olds. What's your assessment? And it could go either way. Like, I've heard some people be positive, I've heard people be more negative. Where do you stand on young people's political 
leanings you, in the future. Yes. I, I have a lot of, you know, quote unquote normie friends that I went to high school with, to college <laughs> with, who didn't know I was political. They've reached out to me privately and they say, you know, God bless brother. I love what you're doing. Keep up the fight. I hate what's going on. You know, I don't want to speak up because of my job. I don't want to speak up because of, of my friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are just scared to talk about it. Sure. I know a lot of people uh, that, you know, I grew up with and they were good people and they've just completely gone off the deep end in terms of this, this radical wokeism. I mean, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, but I think in general, I think there's a lot more people out there that are reasonable. Maybe they don't agree on every policy point. You know, maybe they're not going to talk to you about, you know, the intricacies of, uh, of, of immigration policy. But for something like this history, something about just loving this country, that's a pretty standard, uh, you know, thing we can all get, a, get behind. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of people stand up and saying, yes, I'm with you. Young and yeah, old. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a simple one. You would think. Hopefully, they're going too far and they're helping us rally. Um, give me some encouraging story that you've had over this last week or so uh, from people you've heard from or whatever uh, since you've been standing up. I mean, with the outpouring of support, my club has received, you know, thousands of dollars in donations. We've got tons of new members. Our inboxes are packed with, with letters of support. Yes, we have the occasional loser trolling us, attacking us, but that's to be expected when you stand up for something. Uh, the press has been incredible. Uh, I did Laura Ingram last night. So, you know, we're just, we're just, we're just doing this cool. bit by bit. Uh, I said last night, we're trying to build a movement. Uh, we're trying to stand up finally. I mean, here in New York City, we got plenty of things to protest about. There's no shortage. <laughs> uh, so now that we're going into the summer and uh, King Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio uh, are not letting us, uh, you know, hold events. We're going to start holding rallies instead. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to let our voices be heard, stand for our police, stand for our country, and push back against this uh, cultural revolution that's engulfing our country. Are you prepared to get beat up? Well, the funny thing about it is that I think anyone who goes to a gym or actually, you know, eats red meat tends to be conservative. I don't know. There's something about like the, the biology, psychology about that. Uh, but look, we, we saw Antifa people there. I mean, they're all they're all scrawny. They're all ridiculous. They only charge when they have the numbers. <laughs> A funny enough story mm -hmm. is that when we showed up, you know, we got there from 11, we were going all the way till two or three. There were 200 plus of us. They didn't show up. There were no counter protesters. The second we left and there was a few stragglers, you know, the people remaining, maybe like a, a dozen or two, that's when this massive, you know, 100 plus Antifa BLM uh, march started. They purposely waited until we left because they only like to attack uh, when there's only, when, when you don't have the numbers, when they could just surround you as, uh, you know, sole individuals. Uh, so there's strength in numbers. And if we stand up and unite, uh, they'll, they'll run and flee. They're so used to weak leadership, uh, sadly, yeah. from our side, that when they see strong leadership, when they see people standing for our anthem and everything, uh, they run and hide. Yeah, which makes perfect sense, because look at the cowardly thing they're doing. They're tearing down statues, which by definition cannot speak for themselves, right? So that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, and, and they're going to run from actual real people like you as well. Uh, Gavin, you're the man. Where should we forward people to learn more about you and your group and to support you? Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. You can follow me on Twitter, Parlor, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at Gavin Wax, G-A-V-I-N-W-A-X. And you can follow my club at NYYRC and on, on online, www.nyyrc.com. Cool. New York Young Republican Club. All right, Gavin, let's talk again, man. Superb job. Keep it up. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Awesome. More of that encouraging. Erasing history, left-wing lunacy. See you on Monday. Spread the word.